here. And he went right to the heart of the bias in neoclassical theory to try to drive everything down to micro by saying that that's the basis, you've got to go back and base it on microeconomic theory. Must have good micro foundations. How many decades has that line been coming out? That's Solow's reaction to that statement. It's a delusion. <coughs> Why is it a delusion? Because of the sun and shine mantle to Burr condition. I'll do a quick poll. Who knows of those conditions in this room? Hand up if you do. All right. I think I've made my point. I can stop now. Well, I won't. Of course, I'm going to tell you what they are. He said, given those conditions, the only restrictions you can put on a model in a Walrasian framework is homogeneity and uh, continuous functions. That's it. Well, why? What are those conditions? Well, we've all taught the law of demand, or learnt the law of demand, and that applies to an individual Hicksian compensated demand curve, where you've proved that if you Hicksian compensate the boost in income that applies when you have a, a fall in price, you necessarily have an increase in demand of price fall. That's the law of demand. And the question that the SMD conditions that they're known, amongst the very tiny minority of economists who actually know them, is does that apply to the market demand curve? And the categorical conclusion is no. And this is stated, by the way, this is a highly radical left-wing publication called the Handbook of Macroeconomics, oh, sorry, Handbook of Mathematical Economics, published by Solo and Intrilligator. You can't get much more mainstream than that. I'm not talking a bunch of lefty post-Keynesians or Marxists doing. This is internal top-ranked neoclassical theorists publishing this work. And they said every polynomial is an excess fu demand function for some commodity in a general equilibrium framework. And that, let's put that in English, that's saying the demand curve for a single market can have any shape at all that you can describe using a polynomial <coughs> equation. Therefore, what we're doing when we write, draw a downward sloping market demand curve, we are violating a fundamental aspect of neoclassical theory. Because any shape you can draw without taking a hand off the paper and without cutting through the line at any time is a valid demand curve. You should be drawing squiggly lines for market demand curves, let alone the entire economy. An enormous fallacy. So what's the logic behind it? How do we prove that market demand curves don't obey the law of demand, even if you're summing up the demand of individuals who do obey that law of demand? Because you add Crusoe to Friday with downward sloping market demand curves, that's what you can get. That's what you should be drawing in micro. Well, I see this as an accidental proof by contradiction, which is a hallowed technique in mathematics. The Pythagoreans first accidentally used it to prove that the square root of 2 was an irrational number. In fact, they proved the square root of 5 was, and the person who proved it made a very sudden acquaintance with the depths of the Med Mediterranean Sea as his fellows threw him overboard and drowned him. Neoclassical economics instead has drowned this result. So how do you go about a proof by contradiction? You assume that market demand curves do obey the law of demand. You derive conditions under which this is true, and you then find those con conditions contradict your initial assumptions. So you've therefore proven that they don't obey the law of demand. That's fundamentally what the SMD conditions have done. <coughs> now, the logic behind it is that changing prices alters income distribution. So let's go through what actually happens in deriving the Hicksian compensated argument. First of all, you take an individual with a well-behaved utility function and they vary the price of one commodity while keeping the others constant and the consumer's income constant, and you can derive, a most of the time, a downward sloping demand curve. But of course, you've got the hassle of good and goods and so on. Now, key assumptions in this are, first of all, that you can vary the price without varying the consumer's income, which is fair enough in the case of an individual. And what it means is that pivot point stays stationary. But the second stage of it is you say, well, having done that, you know you've got an income effect as well as a substitution effect. So you can eliminate the substitution effect by moving back to the indifference curve you started from, and then you derive a downward sloping Hicksian compensated demand curve. Now, the SMD conditions were saying, well, we know this applies to the individual. Does it survive aggregation? And the answer was no. What actually happens? Well, the, the individual demand curve stuff ignores the impact of changing price on income. But you can't do that in general <coughs> equilibrium or general anything else. If you have two or more consumers, each must have different income sources otherwise you've, and also different tastes. Otherwise, you're working with clones. You've just got a single individual. And similarly, tastes have to change with income because if they don't, there's only one commodity. So your starting assumptions are 
that you can do it properly and you have two consumers, two commodity world, where you can taste change with income. That's your starting point. So let's say Crusoe and Friday are our two individuals and coconuts and bananas are our two commodities and Crusoe owns all the banana trees and Friday owns all the coconut trees and coconuts are necessity and bananas are luxury. Let's forget about production, the simple physical, I'm going to leave that out, it's just an exchange economy. Coconuts are the necessity, bananas are the luxury, and Fry, Friday has a high preference for coconuts than does Crusoe. Well, let's start with an arbitrary price ratio. And you keep aggregate income constant. You don't change the number of coconuts and the number of bananas, and consider a lower price for bananas. So you change the slope. Now, Crusoe, who owns the bananas, is going to have a drop in his income. And Friday's, therefore, is going to rise. So the pivot points don't remain constant. And the market demand for bananas could fall because of the lower price, because Crusoe's income has fallen and Friday's income has risen, but Friday has a lower preference for bananas than Crusoe does. What about when you try to do an income compensation, the Hicksian procedure? So you keep relative prices constant and you increase incomes equally. So here we go. We start from this position. We then move those income curves out. But banana demand is, bananas are a luxury. So demand for bananas will rise more with an increase in overall number of coconuts and bananas in proportion to each other <laughs> than coconuts. Therefore, Crusoe's income will rise more than Friday's. So you therefore can't compensate for the income effect. You can't get away from it. A uniform increase in incomes will, link, will alter income distribution and therefore change consumption patterns and change income distribution again. So the outcome of that is that the market demand curve can have any shape you can describe using a polynomial. And the only way to avoid it is first of all to assume that all consumers have identical tastes, so there's only one consumer. And secondly, assume that tastes don't change with income, which means there's only one commodity. That is a proof by contradiction because you started with two consumers with different tastes and two different commodities. So proof by contradiction, the law of demand doesn't apply to the market demand curve, let alone to the entire economy. Now, how is this result communicated to students? Samuelson and Nordhaus, 2010. When I wrote Debunking Economics version of uh, Edition 1, I was criticised by some of the profession for having dated research. Well, I thought I'd start with a 2010 textbook. The market demand curve is found by adding up the quantities demanded by oil individuals at each price. Does the market demand curve obey the law of demand? It certainly does. That is a provably false statement. Now, looking in the book again, I found that Samuelson only thought he proved it by assuming that the entire American economy operated as one big happy family which redistributed income prior to trade. And as I wrote in the book, does the man even live in the United States? Okay. Mas Kalel reproduces the same thing in his gargantuan mumbo jumbo textbook. And when he talks about it, says there's a positive representative agent, but to get a normative one, we must have redistribution prior to trade. And I'm not joking, this is in the book. Say for the redistribution by benevolent central authority. Okay. That's an essential to make market demand curves exist. Good stuff. Varium. I'm so, sorry, he's not here. It is sometimes convenient to think of the aggregate demand curve as the demand of some representative consumer. The conditions under which this can be done are rather stringent, but discussion is beyond the scope of this book. Now that's a reassuring statement that's vague enough to let PhD students continue going down the same path of delusion that Sola referred to earlier. So the real meaning of those SMD conditions is that macro is an emergent property. You'll hear people working in complexity theory, like my friends in the CSIRO, frequently. You don't know what they're talking about. Economics has given a brilliant example of emergent properties. Add together two perfectly, properly functioning, downward sloping individual demand curves, you get a squiggly line. That is an emergent property where it's the interaction of the agents in the system that generates the behaviour. And you cannot reduce macro to applied microeconomics, but that's exactly what DSGE models do. And of course, this is proven different by the SMD conditions. So what is being done by neoclassical theory, and it's common through the entire profession, is it's committing the fallacy of strong reductionism, which is the belief that you can reduce a particular level of analysis to a lower level. Now, in a very important paper called More is Different in the physics literature, a Nobel laureate in physics said more is different. The behaviour of large and complex aggregates 
is, cannot be understood by a simple extrapolation from the properties of a few particles. At each new level, new ideas come forward that are as, at least as complicated as those at the lower level. And he gave an interesting table in saying, let's array the, ta the tables and say, as we would say, that macroeconomics is, uh, the, the core elements of macroeconomics are microeconomic elements. Well, he said, you can do the same with the whole of physics. So you can say, um, physics is the, the god of sciences and chemistry is many body physics, molecular biology is chemistry, cell biology is molecular biology and so on. He said that that might be the belief, but then if you, this hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y. That at each stage, new, new concepts are necessary. This is precisely the fallacy that's dominated the development of economics for the last 40 years. <coughs> it's about time we woke up to ourselves and realised, as the, and the true sciences have done, that it is a fallacy.